Dear friends, I take this opportunity to welcome you and to thank you for joining us for this solemn commemoration of the Passion of Jesus Christ on this Good Friday. The Good Friday liturgy is a bit unique and it consists of three parts, the liturgy, the word, the veneration of the cross, and Holy Communion. My dear friends, let us now prepare our hearts and minds to enter into these sacred moments in which we encounter our dear Lord in sacred scripture and in the sacred liturgy. Welcome. Good afternoon and welcome to St. John Vianney Church in Gladwin, Pennsylvania. It is good to be together as much as we are able to during this difficult time to celebrate God's love for us. O oh God, who by the passion of Christ, your Son, our Lord, abolished the death inherited from ancient sin by every, by every succeeding generation, grant that just as being conformed to him, we have borne by the law of nature the image of the man of earth, so by the sanctification of grace we may bear the image of the man of heaven. Through Christ, our Lord. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance, and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering accustomed to infirmity one of those from whom people hid their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities he bore, our sufferings he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter or a sheep before the shears. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away, and who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sins of his people, a grave was assigned to him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers. Though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood, but the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. 
Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Put my life in your hands. Abba, Abba, I put my life in your hands. In you, Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Justice rescue me. In your hands I command my spirit. Abba, Abba, I put my life in your hands. Abba, Put my life in your hands. For all my foes reproach me, all my friends are now put to flight. I am forgotten like the dead, like a dish that now is broken. Put my life in your hands. Abba, Abba, I put my life in your hands. I place my trust in you. In your hands is my to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was similarly tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. even 
because of this God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him a name which is above every Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with the disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am, so if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said, I have not lost any of those who gave, who gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that my father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guard seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gate gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made, because it was cold, and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about the disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm. And they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they, they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, 
If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back to the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say, I am a king. For this I was born, for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barab Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wo wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, hey, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. 
So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tarry, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom she loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over his spirit. Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of the week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and thought, saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, but one soldier, one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you may also come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. A survey of recent news stories yields the following headlines. Coronavirus pandemic has infected over one million people. Death toll surpasses 60,000 worldwide. Over two dozen people in Europe arrested in human trafficking. Syrian leaders continue to attack their own people. Death toll from a terrorist bombing in Turkey rises. School teacher attacked in her classroom. Our world knows violence, war, 
Injustices, natural disasters, pain, evil, and suffering are no stranger to our world. Perhaps even within our own families and among our friends, within ourselves, we've experienced the burden of poor health or illness. Perhaps our own families and homes have been weighed down to the point of breaking from alcohol or drugs, infidelity, anger, or hardness of heart. Our world and our lives are filled with suffering and pain. And at this moment, in the midst of this worldwide pandemic, we are acutely aware of suffering. One might even be tempted to believe that they alone suffer and that somehow others have escaped human suffering. Former Pope Benedict reminded us that no matter what other people's lives look like on the outside, no human heart passes through this world without suffering. To be human is to be subject to suffering. In the midst of all this suffering and evil, we must ask ourselves, what value, if any, does all this suffering have for us? Moreover, we must ask, why would an all-loving, all-powerful, all-merciful God permit such evil and suffering in our world, in our families, and in our lives? I would submit that the gospel and the entire liturgy of Good Friday asks us to turn our att attention to the cross for the answer. The cross takes place where the horizontal beam meets the vertical beam, symbolically where God encounters man. The cross offers us a deeper meaning for human suffering. As we reflect upon the mystery of evil, which has caused so much suffering, it's helpful to appreciate the distinction between moral evil and physical evil. Moral evil, as we know, arises from one's free choice to do what one knows is wrong, in a word, to sin. Examples of moral evil or sin are acts of murder, terrorism, lying, and cheating. Physical evil, on the other hand, arises from the fallen nat nature of the world. Examples of physical evils that we're subject to include earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, sickness, death, and this terrible pandemic in which we are all now facing. Whether evil is moral that arises from fallen humanity or physical evil arising from a fallen world, all evil causes us pain and suffering. Yet despite the mystery and power of evil, we know that evil cannot come from God. And so where does this evil come from? Our faith teaches us that Almighty God created the world freely out of love. And the Church likewise teaches that God has created humanity in an original state, entailing a fourfold harmony. Man was at peace with God, at peace with others, at peace with the world, and at peace within himself. This fourfold harmony. But this original harmony called original justice and holiness was lost by the misuse of the gift of man's freedom, the one necessary gift from God to humanity for us to love. Our first parents, knowingly and willingly disobeying God, brought evil to the world and thus ruptured this God-given goal of a fourfold harmony. Each subsequent act against God in history from generation to generation has expanded evil and its effects in our world. As a result of our fallen human nature and our fallen world, we feel the tension, the lack of harmony and peace in all four 
these foundational relationships with God, with others, with the world, and with ourselves. For example, we feel the tension, the disharmony within ourselves when we feel a desire to undertake, on one hand, a, our homework assignment, for example, or a house chore, but at the same time, we have a competing desire maybe just to lay about or to play video games. Likewise, for example, we may have a desire to be kind and patient to our loved ones, especially as we're confined to the home, but we find ourselves being irritable and quarrelsome. Again, this tension reveals that we are not in the harmony with others, which has been God's will for us. Physical evils like pandemics and hurricanes reflect our disordered relationship with the world. Our fallen world is no longer a paradise, a walled garden. It is a place where danger lurks for humanity. The prophet Isaiah shared what the world should look like in harmony with man according to God's plan. The wolf shall be a guest of the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion shall browse together with a little child to guide them. And lastly, because of sin, we feel the distance and the silence of God. Our knowledge of him has been dimmed and our love for him is tepid. Evil and sin has caused unhappiness disharmony in our relationship with God, with others, with the world, within ourselves. But God is so good that he will not allow humanity to wallow forever in our fallen nature in this fallen world. In the fullness of time, God the Father sends his only Son into the world to save it, to take it back to ransom it from all the sins of humanity, buying back, restoring, indeed recreating humanity, an act even more greater than original creation. The church fathers and the early church reminded us that God who has created us without our consent will not redeem us without our consent. While creating us was a free gift of God to us without our cooperation, the Lord's gift of salvation to each one of us will entail our cooperation. And so the good thief, as he was hanging upon the cross to the right side of Jesus, cooperated and asked the Lord to save him to give him a place in paradise, to bring about the fourfold harmony ordered by God. The grace of redemption won for all of us on the cross is now freely offered to all. All are invited to cooperate, to participate. Our good God is so good and so powerful that the only reason why he will permit any evil at any time, at any place, is because he promises to draw from it a greater good. Cardinal O'Connor, who was a Philadelphia priest who later became the Archbishop of New York, once said, what is a tragedy is not that there is so much suffering in the world, but that there is so much wasted suffering. Suffering then for humankind, for us, has two effects. If we rail against it, suffering can make us hard and perhaps bitter. It can turn us in ourselves, making us feel sorry for ourselves. It can be completely wasted. But if we offer our sufferings in union with Jesus in this co-redemptive action, Suffering has a potential to transform us, to make us holy. Suffering can be an opportunity to learn among many beautiful things, compassion. Suffering has the potential to break, to stretch our hearts in order to make them bigger, to love more deeply. In the passion narrative, 
which we have just proclaimed, we encounter Simon of Cyrene. He is a bystander who is constrained to carry the cross of Jesus. At first, he reluctantly carries the cross. He does not want to participate, to take up the cross. But once he has picked up the cross, Simon is silently watching Jesus. Simon learns to walk slowly behind the suffering Christ, and he learns to cooperate with Christ for the salvation of the world. With each step, Simon learns patience. He learns strength. He learns sacrificial love. And while Simon carries the cross following Jesus, cooperating with Jesus, he is being changed. He is being transformed. He has been made holy. In the end, the cross, which at first was hateful and repugnant to Simon, something he wanted to run from, is now the very cross that Simon kisses, the cross that we venerate in this liturgy, because it brought to him a deeper understanding of human suffering, a deeper understanding of what faithfulness is, and a deeper understanding of every good virtue, patience, compassion, and above all, true love. Because of the cross, Christians are not afraid of suffering. They understand that suffering is a means of redemptive cooperation, a means of transformation, the path to holiness. The cross is our invitation from God. The cross is our opportunity to grow in sacrificial love. On this Good Friday, like Simon of Cyrene, we take up the cross and all of our challenges and we walk closely following Jesus because under the cross of suffering, we will learn all that we need to know to be holy, to be saved. We will learn compassion. We will learn true sacrificial love. In this way, we learn to kiss the cross, which is the way to our redemption, our share in Christ's redemption. Suffering is the intersection of the cross, where we cross from death to sin and evil, passing on to life eternal. This day we call good, because from the greatest evil in history, the death of innocent Jesus, our Lord, comes the greatest good in human history, the salvation of humanity. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God, the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout all the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord who chose him for the order of bishops may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, 
may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Nelson, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of the inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness for all of their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, you make your church ever fruitful with new offspring. Increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens that, reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our brothers and sisters in Christ that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty and ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right with sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, 
all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of people, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and the freedom of religion may, through your gift, be made secure through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty and ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for a swift end to the coronavirus pandemic that afflicts our world, that our God and Father will heal the sick, strengthen those who care for them, and help us all to persevere in faith. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing, look with compassion on your world, brought low by disease, Protect us in the midst of the grave challenges that assail us, and in your fatherly providence grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge. Through Christ our Lord.
At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may always be free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So Kingdom. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
For those who now cannot receive the Blessed Sacrament, let us pray together a prayer of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the Most Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and I unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, and by partaking of this sacred mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. <laughs> 